All right? All right, uh, let's start. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Thailand uh, to our, this press conference that we have organized on enforced disappearance. Uh, this press conference is jointly organized by uh, FIDH, uh, the Justice for Peace Foundation, Human Rights Watch, and Focus on the Global South. Uh, my name is Shalmali Guttel, and I'm the director of Focus on the Global South. Um, on 15th December, Nine, uh, 2012, Sombat Sompon, who was a prominent uh, and well-respected civil society leader in Laos, was disappeared. Um, it was evening, it was in full public view, and um, there was plenty of evidence as to uh, what, you know, what the, uh, around the circumstances of his disappearance. Um, and we had all hoped, uh, and we continue to hope, that with the amount of information and evidence that was there for an investigation, that the case would be quickly resolved, Sombat would be found and returned uh, to his family and to his community. But seven years on, that has not happened. Um, and Sombat Sompon, of course, is a very well-known um, figure in the world of community development, sustainable development. He is the recipient of the Maxese Award for Community Leadership. Um, you know, and uh, there is his disappearance and abduction caused a huge outcry. There was drew a lot of international attention. Um, it wasn't just in this region, but you know, um, human rights and diplomats, officials, and um, you know, very well known, eminent people uh, wrote to the Lao government and wrote to the United Nations asking for a proper investigation into his disappearance. So of course one thought that with all this international attention, something with uh, you know news will come out. But as I said, uh, we have had um, no news at all. Uh, well, the, or the news that we have had, um, his partner Shui Ming, uh, who is here, uh, she will she will tell us about it. One important thing about um, the position, the official positions that we've seen on the on the disappearance and the investigation, is that rather than the investigation progressing, we have seen the positions of official position regressing. And again, Swimming can tell us more about that. Um, but of course, Sombat's disappearance was not the only case. On 12th March 2004, Mr. Somchai Nilapaiji, a very well-known, well-respected human rights lawyer in Thailand, was abducted from outside his car, also in the evening, on a very busy street in Bangkok. There was no CCTV camera footage, but there were quite a lot of, um, they, they were witnesses, they were people who saw the abduction. Again, it seemed like with witnesses and with the timeline put on it, the case could be resolved and uh, the whereabouts of Somchai would be found and Somchai could be returned to his family, but that has not happened. And again, what, in terms of what has been happening in Thailand, we have Kunan Kananila Paijit, um, the wife of Mr. Somchai, who will talk about this um, and tell us more about what's happening in Thailand. Now, again, these are not um, the only cases. On 17th April in 2014, Paula G. Rakchongkaran, who I think many of you know as Billy, who is a well-known Karen rights activist, he was disappeared at the Krankachan National Park. And again, there were witnesses. Um, Billy was not only a Karen community leader, he was also suing uh, a leading park official for violent evictions of Karen community, uh, community residents who were in that area, in, that, in the Kankachan district. Um, in this case, there has been some resolution, a very unfortunate and tragic resolution. And I think um, Phil and Kacha can tell us, talk, talk to us more, and so also uh, Kunan Kana will tell us more about this. But then when we go uh, further, we think that, well, with all this hitting the news, there must be some change and that these cases would somehow stop happening, but they haven't. Between June 2016 and December 2018, five Thai nationals who were living in exile in Laos went missing. The bodies of two were found and identified through DNA testing. There was another body found which wasn't identified. Um, the others are still missing. 
But even for the bodies that were found, who were found, what happened to them? Who took them? How did this happen? There's no news about that. And 26th August 2019, this year, recently, Ot a Lao uh, worker living in exile in, um, in Thailand for several years, he went missing. Um, subsequently, there have been other cases of uh, people that he knows and that he was working with. Um, the latest case is that we know of is one Mr. Phitputon, who's gone missing in Laos. Now, what is remarkable about these cases also is that Mr. Otsayavong was is Lao, but he was living in Thailand. And his case was reported by his, the people he was sharing a house with and his colleagues. Um, it was reported to the police. The police have launched, the Thai police have launched an investigation, but we do not know um, what is the progress of that investigation. So far, we, the, the, what we hear is that there are no leads, there's no resolution to the case. Um, in the meantime, Ott's family continues to get all kinds of um, uh, misleading fake news about where Ott might be. Now, these are only the cases we know of. There are many, many more cases um, in this region that are not reported, that we don't know about because families and friends of those who have disappeared do not come forward. Um, why don't they come forward? Well, a big reason is fear. Um, again, I think um, Schwimming and Kunankana and Katya and Phil can explain to us what is the fear that happens what is the fear that's created among the families and those who know those who are enforced to disappear? Why don't they come out and say, somebody's gone missing, I'm scared, do something, I need help? Why, why doesn't this happen? Um, another issue about enforced disappearance is that um, it's surrounded by a tremendous amount of impunity because enforced disappearance is a crime is an abduction that happens with the involvement of officials, usually state officials, but we can't always be sure. And so those in power are able to protect themselves and keep themselves hidden from, uh, you know, from, from public accountability and able to escape public accountability. And possibly this level of impunity also adds to the fear of families and friends and why they wouldn't um, you know, report these cases, right? Um, under human, international human rights law, enforced disappearance is a continuing crime. It's considered a continuing crime until the fate and whereabouts of the disappeared people are known. Um, but because it has been recognized under international human rights law, there are also international human rights mechanisms to address this uh, continuing crime. And um, our colleague Kacha Churisi will, will tell us more about that. So. Uh, we have a very eminent panel here of people who have been dealing with this crime personally, in their, as having been victims, but also uh, through their engagement in the human rights world. Um, our first speaker will be Shweming, Ng Shweming, who is the wife of Sombat Sompon, but she has also been a leading, I mean, a, a senior official in UNICEF in Southeast Asia, including as country director in East Timor. Then we will have Kun Ankana Nila Paichit, who is the wife of Somchai Nila Paijit, but also she is the chairman or chairperson of the Justice for Peace Foundation. Uh, she's the former commissioner of the National Human Rights Commission of Thailand. And extremely important, she is the recipient of the Magsaysay Award in 2019 um, as a champion of human rights. And Kun Ankana's courage and her support for all victims of human rights violations has really made her a leading figure and an inspiration and a source of support, not just in Thailand, but, but across the region for all those who are, um, who are you know, facing these uh, types of human rights abuses, violations, and fear. And we are very, very honored that Kunankana is here. And I, on behalf of all of us, we congratulate Kunankana again on the recipient, to be the recipient of the Magsaysay Award. Um, we have then, um, we have Ms. Kacha Churitsi, from the office of the, the OHCHR, the Office of the Commissioner of the Human Rights. She's the Deputy Representative for Southeast Asia. And we have uh, Phil Robertson from Human Rights Watch, who is the Deputy, Deputy Director for Asia. So 
One can say a lot about all of them, but rather than that, let me just go right into the speakers. Um, the way we would do, like to do this is let the speakers speak, make their initial presentations. We open up the floor for um, comments, questions, and then we continue the discussion. So, Shui Ming, please. Thank you. Thank you, Shamali. Thank you, and good morning to everyone for coming. But before we start, I just want uh, everyone to join me and my family as we did two days ago to have a moment of silence to pray and to bless Sombat, wherever he is, for his safe return and to have a resolution for his case. I also want all of us, as we think about and pray for Sombat, not to forget all the other victims. For Dr. Sumjai Nilai Paiji, for Mr. Ot Sayawong, for Pet Puton, who recently disappeared, two Lao persons, and also for Sompon Kantisuk, who has disappeared years before Sombat, and all the other victims, all the other unknown victims who have disappeared. So let's spend a moment of silence to remember them. Thank you. Another year has passed, and we are here again to hold another panel discussion to highlight the case of Sombat and the other victims of enforced disappearance in the region. And I thank you all for coming. Many of you, I recognize, you have come every year, and you have shown your support and set fitness for Sombat and for me. And also to the new faces, to those who have not come here before, I thank you. And also please pick up a brochure that is at the entrance and there you will find a very simple description of what happened to Sombat. Every year when we have a panel discussion here, I'm always faced with this difficulty. What can I say? What do I say? Many of you continue to be interested and want to hear some news, some new information, a little progress as to what happened to the case some breakthrough, some good news. And maybe to even say there is a whistleblower who recently came forth with some information. But unfortunately, as in the case of Sombat and also all the other victims, there has been no new information. For me, there's been zero, nothing. Nada, zilch, nothing. And journalists continue to ask, when was the last time the police spoke to you? The last time, for your interest, was on 21st of November 2017, and I met the police at the behest, at the request of my ambassador, the Singapore ambassador, who knocked on every door and said, please, meet Shuming, meet her family, give her some report. So they met me, and that was the last time. And there's nothing. Nobody come forth with anything. So I sometimes wonder, why do I keep speaking? Why do I keep advocating? Why do I keep pushing? every angle 
with every diplomatic um, person, our friends here from the Swedish Embassy, from, the Brit from EU, from all the other journalists and so on. Why do I keep talking? And then, for me, the question at the back of my mind is, would people still care with the passing of time? Would they still remember? But I believe it does. It has to, because silence will mean the perpetrators have won. That's what they want. They want me to be quiet. They want all of you not to come and ask about Sombat or pay any interest to Sombat or Dr. Somjai or all the other victims of enforced disappearance. They want us to be quiet. They want the world to forget. But we will not forget. We will continue to highlight the terrible abuse of violation of rights of the disappeared and the other victims of human rights abuses, of the other violations that continue to take place in Laos, in Thailand, in Malaysia, in the region, in Myanmar, and everywhere that it happens. We need to continue to shine a light of human decency, a light of truth, to crack the darkness of such crimes of deception, such evil and abuse against humanity. So for you, my friends and supporters, once more, I want to say from the deepest parts of my heart, I want to say thank you. You give me strength. You give me courage. You are the reason why I find the strength to get up each day. And to give you a little bit of update, not that there's very much of what's happening in Laos, we just heard from Shamali, Ot Sayevong, Pat Puton, they, have, they are migrant workers here. They lived here. In the case of Ad Put, uh, Ad Sayavong, he was disappeared from Thailand. Thailand is supposed to be a democratic country. Where there's rule of law, he was disappeared. And Put, Pat Puton, he went home. He wanted to see his family. And before he even had a chance to see his family, he was just taken away. And nobody know, nobody know what happened. There were, f inside Laos, inside Laos, there was no mention of Ot Sayavong, no mention of Pat Puton, no mention of any case of anybody disappeared. So, as far as the people in Laos is concerned, life goes on, nothing is happening. You know, and we have to, all this great development is going on. That is the silence, the wall of silence. The deception is the hardest thing the victims have to face. And also, as Shamali has mentioned, the narrative about Somba's disappearance have shifted a little. So initially, the government and the police acknowledged, yes, Sombat was stopped at the police post, and uh, we didn't know what happened to him after he was stopped, but they at least acknowledged that fact. Now they're saying, casting rumors, oh, um, it's probably because he's actually a bad person. Look at the amount of wealth he has. He has a lot of land. How did a community worker get so much land? But they never tell you how much, how many pieces of land, how, how did he get the land, nothing. It's enough to just spread rumors. 
Because in Laos, we thrive on rumors. We thrive on deception. We thrive on fear. We, meaning the government, they thrive on fear. As long as people are fearful, as long as people believe in the stories they spread, in the lies they tell, life goes on. Hunker dory for everybody. And that's exactly what happened. I just want to close by telling you, this year we held a press blessing for Sombat in a temple. And many people hold blessing ceremonies in Laos for families, for the communities, for any event happening in their, in their lives. And normally it takes place everywhere. But for Sombat, before the prayer ceremony, neighbors were, not to me directly, was, were asking my niece and people who are uh, living around us, what, what, we, we, we have been asked by, by people, they never tell you who, but sometimes they say they will be asked by secret police or people not in uniforms, what, what are they doing? What actions are they taking on the 15th? Uh, and, and be careful, you should not be part of it. And that's enough to scare people. My, my neighbors were so afraid. They didn't turn up for the prayer ceremony. That is the tactic they use. They continue to use fear. They continue to spread rumors. And it's enough for most of the Lao people. It's enough that they know that the police is following you, that you must have done some wrong. Otherwise, why would the police follow you? Why would the police ask about you? One day before the prayer ceremony, someone called my niece. What are you people doing? Why didn't you get permission? And my niece said, get permission for what? Whatever you are doing. They know because we have already posted the event and sent out the invitation publicly through social media. So just to tell you, that is the tactic. And while I'm not afraid, but I have to tell you, my family was afraid. My friends were afraid. My neighbors were afraid. It's, and that is the fear we live in inside Laos. But I want to let everyone know, I may be only a fly in their soup. I may be a mosquito in the ear of the elephant. I will continue. Because not to continue is to accept the impunity, is to accept the violation of my right and the rights of all the other victims. Please, join me. Be the mosquito in the year of the elephant. The mos one mosquito in the year of elephant may not cause any fear or irritant, but if thousands and thousands of mosquitoes in the year of the elephant, the elephant will fall. So I thank you all again, and I really sincerely thank you for showing up. And to my sister in courage, Sister, in solidarity, Ankana, you have been an inspiration. Without your inspiration, I would not have been able to walk this journey. Thank you. Thank you, Shwimi. I request uh, Kunankana to please take the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Shamali. Thank you, P. Shumi. Uh, good morning, our excellencies, colleagues, and friends. Um, this is an added year no, that we are together and speak the same things of uh, the person who disappeared. It's again and again as it's really uh, very traumatized when speaking about uh, what has happened. I remember very well in early 2013 when I first met uh, Pi Ming in Bangkok. I can feel that she's very kind and humble and she's very impressed to me as she's, um, she's 
very, she's a woman who is very uh, optimist. She firmly believed that Sombat is still alive, and one day he shall return to his family. And until now, nobody can break her hope that Sombat will return safely. As one of the victims of enforced disappearance in Thailand, I totally understand how difficult to continue the life of the family members to, who were left behind every anniversary of our loved one who disappeared. It reminds us about the injustice in our society. In Thailand, there's uh, many cases of human rights defenders who disappeared during the past decade. And access to truth and remedies are always denied, and impunity remains in the country. During the first UPR Thailand review in 2011, the Thai government announced it in the Human Rights Council that Thailand will sign and ratify the Convention Against Export Disappearance. And on 9th of January 2012, Thailand has signed the Convention and promised to have the organic law on torture and enforced disappearance. On May 24, uh, 2016, the cabinet agreed to ratify the Convention Against Enforced Disappearance and forward the draft prevention and suppression of torture and enforced disappearance bill to the National Legislative Assembly, or uh, NRA. But the NRA rejected the draft bill by sending, them, sending it back to the MOJ to amend it in some sections. Yet progress on this matter has been hindered by the coup installed at NRA. This does not care about public participation, nor input from victims' families in deliberating the bill. Uh, the NRA organized the ad hoc committee for uh, review the bill, but the families and civil society were excluded. I, I have the impression that the NRA is vetting the bill with fears and concern that it may be used to, to target state officials and that may obstruct the work of state authorities. With some concern, <coughs> some elements in the NRA in the National Legislative Assembly may have tried to insert mechanisms that could better protect the authorities rather than human rights and the rights of the people who were disappeared and tortured. This means the law may not really help victims nor their families. In other words, the law may be watered down so that it does not really prevent torture and infant disappearance in Thailand. In September 2019, the Ministry of Justice submitted the revised draft bill to the NRA again, but the process of legislation was much delayed. And on 7 of March 2019, the last day of NRA, the draft bill on prevention and suppression of torture and enforced disappearance is still pending. On March 2017, Thailand committed to the ICCPR committee that why the draft bill is under consideration and review. The Prime Minister of Thailand has issued NCPO order number uh, 131 Salat 2017, date on 23rd of May 2017, to establish the National Committee for Managing Cases Relating to Torture and Enforced Disappearance. With the Minister of Justice as a chairperson and 13 representatives from related agencies as members, in order to address alleged cases of torture and enforced disappearance. Recently, I was informed by the Minister of Justice that the National Committee as Interim Mechanism has stopped the mandate. 
after election. That means now there are no mechanism to investigate the cases of torture and enforced disappearance in the country. And sadly to say that during 2018, under the, uh, the National Committee, I was informed that by the families of the disappeared who complained to the UN Working Group, the family who submit their complaint of their families member who disappeared, it's allowed uh, 32 cases of complaint to the UN Working Group on for disappearance. The family said that they were visited by the representative of the Ministry of Justice and the village headman in their districts. The family said that the official asked them to withdraw the case from the UN Working Group on for disappearance as the working group have no legitimacy to investigate the cases in the country. And if the family needs some money, the government can provide them. Most families are ethnic minorities, or some of them stay in rural area. They were very really scattered and afraid of reprisal. Some of them cannot deny signing the agreement to withdraw the complaint from the UN working group. Moreover, I was told that the official denied that to give them further information about themselves, for example, their name and contact. The families of victims who disappeared in May 1992 cracked down. Most of them are very old and some already passed it away. They said that the official from the Minister of Justice, uh, the Rights and Liberty Protection Department, <coughs> told them that the victims, some victims still alive, but they don't want to back to their family. And they not disappear. They just only want to, not want to contact their families. And how the family didn't believe the information from the Ministry of Justice. I'm seriously concerned that why the government should investigate all the cases of important dis disappearance in, in, the, in Thailand until the families know the fate and whereabouts of their loved one. The government tried to convince the families to withdraw the cases from the UN Working Group on Infant Disappearance in order to reduce the number of infant disappearance in the country. So this means Rise to the truth, judicial remedies, and reparation are still denied by Thai state, and impunity will remain in, the, in Thailand. In my opinion, the legislature must respect a crucial clause in the UN Convention that, and for this appearance, is a continuous crime and has no statute of limitations. The law must endorse the rights of the victims' families to gain access to justice. The state has the duty to investigate until the fate of all victims becomes known. Even if such a crime took place before the law become effective. Colleagues, it is hard to imagine how immense the impact causes by infant disappearance on the victims themselves, their community, and their society as well as directly on economic, social, and cultural rights. In addition, infant disappearance is a creation of ambiguity in between the existent and non-existent. It has made the traumas inflicted that more complicated and aggravated than other kinds of human rights violation. Infant disappearance has even caused tremendous fear among families of the victims. It does not just rain the wound on the body of the victim, but also crush the victim's selfness and degrading his or her humanity, dignity, and identity, directly and indirectly, including the secondary victims, for example, his or her families and their society. 
And for this appearance may lead to extensive impact on victims' physical health and mental condition. Such ambiguity has made the victim constantly engrossed in excessive imagination of the disappearance, being haunted by the imagination of the, how the loved one subjected maybe to torture, inhuman and ill treatment, pains, and even in the destruction and concealment of the bodies. The families of the victims, as a result, have to live with traumas and the share and grossly inhuman and cruel in memories that define their life perpetually. Such deep, deep impact have made the secondary victims find it difficult to get reconnected themselves with their society. It's made, it has made their daily life living a challenge. Also, it has made the victims find it difficult and feel the pressure when having to interact with their society. Many victims suffer post-traumatic stress disorder as a result. Some are constantly consumed by fear and anxiety that making them lost trust in their immediate persons or become pessimism. Som Chai Nila Pajit is not the only Himalayan defenders to fall victim of positive disappearance in Thailand. There were so many life activists that were being killed, assaulted, or harmed in various ways. And as long as our justice system cannot punish the conscripts, marries because they are state official, I, like, so many in this society will remain a victim of a fraud system with those in power continue to remain indifferent to the hardship of people to deprive their life and justice. Today is the seventh year anniversary of the disappearance of Sombat Somporn. I stand in solidarity and in unity with Pishuming and Sombat family. I stand in solidarity with her relentless and untiring struggle to get through and justice. I also stand in unity with her pain, a pain that no wife should ever have to bear, to have their loved one to turn away from them in such an ignoble manner. I also stand in unity with her anger of the impunity and of the system of injustice. And I do believe that in one day, the truth will come. I thank you very much. Thank you, Kunankana. Uh, before we move to the next speaker, just I'd like to flag a couple of points that both the first two speakers have raised. One is the attempts by officials to disappear the disappearance itself by blocking news, by creating fear, and so on, so that the disappeared person does, I mean, we don't even, even the disappearance disappears. And this is one of the reasons why we have to keep drawing attention. And we need diplomats, the press, and the international community to keep, at the, to keep asking questions. Another of two important issues that, are, that they both mentioned, uh, again, were the, ha the use of disinformation and a character assassination and maligning, you know, uh, somehow as though somebody can be deserving of such a crime, which is absolutely wrong. And then, of course, the issue of reprisals, which special rapporteurs uh, have also written uh, to the Lao government on the issue of reprisals. So now let's move to the next two set of speakers. Um, first, Katja Chiritsi from OHCHR. Please tell us what is happening in the OHCHR and what are the mechanisms available for us to tackle this continuing crime. Thank you. Thank you, Shalmani, and uh, it's extremely sobering to take the floor after the two extremely powerful uh, um, accounts shared by um, Kun Ankana and Ms. Shung Mei. Um, but we'd really like to thank for the opportunity provided to our office to be here today and to contribute the, to the discussion of what is definitely uh, an ongoing and even expanding uh, heinous crime across um, Southeast Asia. 
and forced disappearance and, uh, uh, as I said, it's a particularly heinous violation of human rights and it's also an international crime. And it occurs when uh, persons are arrested, detained or abducted against their will or otherwise deprived of their liberty by officials, by any branches of the government, by organized groups or also by private individuals who operate on behalf of or with the support, whether direct or indirect, um, consent and acquisitions of the government. Um, and enforced disappearances, as we, we heard already so strongly today, are um, usually followed by a refusal to disclose to families and their legal representatives the fate or whereabouts uh, of the persons concerned and, and their loved ones and family members, or even the refusal to acknowledge um, the deprivation of their liberty, which places up these people for all purposes outside the protection of, uh, of any law, whether it's domestic law or international human rights law. Um, the UN General Assembly has often described any act of disappearance uh, as an offense to human dignity. And uh, the Declaration on the Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearance clearly states, and I quote, enforced disappearances undermine the deepest values of any society committed to respect of rule of law, human rights, and fundamental freedoms. And the systematic practice of such act uh, is of the nature of a crime against humanity. And I hand the quote. The enforced disappearance of persons infringes upon uh, a range of human rights which are both embodied in the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and also set out in international human rights instruments, including the 1922 Declaration on the Protection of All Persons um, uh, from Enforced Disappearance and the International Convention for the Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearance. Um, this convention was adopted with a specific aim to strengthen international uh, uh, criminal and human rights framework from the protection of persons from enforced disappearance. And the convention is the international legally binding instrument against the disappearance of persons. And I will come back shortly to the convention and also the negative uh, rate of ratification in, uh, in Southeast Asia and what are the implications of that. Again, as we very strongly heard this morning, the victims of enforced disappearances are frequently uh, in constant fear for their lives. And, uh, and this also includes a variation of, uh, of um, violations of human rights, uh, which ranges from allegations of tortures all the way to deprivation of life. Having been removed from the protection of the law um, and disappear from society, they are deprived of all their basic rights, um, including the right to life, the right to liberty and security of the person, and the right not to be subjected to torture, and the right to recognition as a person before the law. At the same time, a disappearance takes a very high emotional toll on families of the victims who remain unaware of the fate of their loved ones, sometimes for years, searching for answers and waiting for news that may never come. For this very reason, and recognizing the psychological and physical strain on family members of disappeared persons, the Convention, Article 24, includes in the definition of victim not only the disappeared ones, uh, but also any individual who has suffered harm as the direct result of an enforced disappearance, such as a family member. Enforced disappearances are indeed a global um, problem, but in Southeast Asia this practice has traditionally been used by states as a means of silencing political opponents or critical voices. And our office, both globally and here in the region, has noted how over the past years the use of enforced disappearance um, has increasingly targeted also human rights defenders and lawyers, political activists and independent journalists. Not to mention the worrisome trend in relation to the number of enforced disappearances occurring in the context of uh, states uh, state actions to counter terrorist activities, um, as well as in the context of the so-called war on drugs. 
OHCHR also notes with great concern that most cases of enforced disappearance in the region uh, remain unresolved. And the victims and their, and their families are unable to obtain the truth and redress for these violations. This is because despite the high number of reported cases of enforced disappearance, countries in the region have yet to develop a clear national legislation specifically criminalizing enforced disappearances and incommunicado detention. In addition to that, Southeast Asia has a negative record when it comes to the ratification of international human rights instruments and specifically the International Convention on Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearance. The only country in the region who has ratified the convention, that being Cambodia in 2013, um, also does not have individual complaint procedures in place. So it means that the Committee on Enforced Disappearance is not given the uh, ability to receive complaints directly from or on behalf of the victims or other state parties. Um, three countries in the region, namely Indonesia, Lao PDR and Thailand, have signed the convention. And as a signatory, um, they are expected to act according to the spirit of its provision um, and have the obligation to refrain from any action that defeat the, uh, the purpose of the treaty, even prior to its entry into force. And this is a very important uh, element to highlight. However, they remain not yet legally uh, bound by the provisions of the convention until the ratification occurs. And other countries in the region also have taken no concrete steps towards the ratification. The non-applicability of the convention in most countries of the region, the consequent shortcomings in national legislation uh, due to the lack of compliance with international principles, the absence of uh, political will to address uh, these grave violations have led to widespread impunity for perpetrators of enforced disappearance and to the inability of victims to obtain justice, seek redress, and of the families to know the truth about the fate of their loved ones. With a view to provide an avenue for families to seek truth about their disappearing relatives, the, the United Nations and the Human, right, uh, the Human Rights Council have established the Working Group on Enforced um, and Involuntary Disappearance, whose basic mandate is to assist relatives to ascertain the fate and whereabouts of their disappeared family members. And for this purpose, the working group examines reports of disappearance received from uh, relatives of human rights organizations acting on their behalf. Important to know that the working groups deals with the cases on a purely humanitarian basis. So this is irrespective of whether governments have ratified any relevant uh, treaty providing for an individual complaint procedure. Dear friends, I would also like to take this opportunity to remember the colleagues of France who have been victims of enforced disappearances. Um, and of course, that is the one of uh, Mr. Sombat Sofon, um, which has been uh, uh, remembered, and the, 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 the seventh anniversary of Hoop's disappearance we are marking um, today and this day. Um, the case of uh, Mr. Polya Jibili Ranjal Karohan, again a current community activist who was last seen alive on 17th of April 2014. The most recent case of uh, Mr. Hod Sayavong, a Lao refugee living in Bangkok who has been missing since 26th of August 2019. And of course the case of Mr. Son Chainila Pajit. Um, who has been missing since uh, March 2014 and whose fate remains uh, unknown. In these and all the other cases of enforced disappearances, our office strongly calls on governments to launch or continue or activate prompt, thorough and impartial investigations in line with international legal standards and human rights standards with a view to determine their fate and whereabouts and bring the perpetrators to justice. We also urge governments to promptly ratify the International Convention for the Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearance and to incorporate the convention provisions into their domestic legal frameworks. 
I would also like to take this opportunity uh, to acknowledge, as done by uh, previous speakers, the key role that uh, uh, Kun Ankana, um, who is also the former Thailand's Human Rights Commissioner in Thailand, has played in the efforts against the heinous crime on enforced disappearances in Thailand. Her husband, as I said, was missing since 2004, and since then her tireless work to obtain truth and justice has not only kept her husband's case in focus, but it also brought the shortfalls in Thailand's laws, procedures, and investigative methods and political into the spotlights. And her wider preventive impact and her perseverance has been highlighted in numerous recognitions and again, including the recent Ramon Magsay Award. I would also acknowledge uh, Kun Hangana's uh, commitment, but also um, Ms. Shi Meng and uh, Pinaka Prunekapsan, uh, role in, uh, in and their tireless efforts in uh, pursuing the uh, justice and remedies, not only for the cases that they are directly involved in, but for this means for the global advocacy fight in ensuring um, uh, proper human rights uh, redress of these crimes. I would also like to conclude highlighting how, while a big attention of the international human rights community is on uh, pursuing focus on implementation of the 2013 agenda, how it is important that the ratification of the convention and equally important its full implementation is seen as an integral part of, uh, of, uh, of this agenda and not as an alternative. Um, and this applies in particular to SDG 16 in promoting the rule of law, ensuring equal access to justice and ending impunity. And with this goal in mind, uh, OHCHR, both globally and our office here in the region, will continue to strongly advocate for the ratification of the international human rights treaties in Southeast Asia and to call on legislators to enact strong national laws specifically criminalizing and forced disappearance, and to promptly investigate these grave violations of human rights. Thank you, very, uh, thanks a lot again for giving me this opportunity today. Thank you very much, uh, Kun Katya. Now uh, I request uh, Phil Robertson, who is the Deputy Director for Asia for Human Rights Watch, to place, locate this entire crime in a regional context and tell us what other efforts and uh, mechanisms we can use to end this crime. Thank you. Thank you, Shamali. And uh, let me say, first of all, that uh, it's always uh, sobering to be on a panel with uh, Shui Meng and Ankana to discuss these issues of enforced disappearance. Uh, these are crimes that have uh, shattered their families, have shattered their lives. Uh, for anyone that this hasn't actually happened to, it's, it's, it's hard to actually understand, I think, the gravity of this crime and the unending nature of it. Uh, this is, uh, you know, among the worst human rights crimes because of the uncertainty, because of the continuation of the, the memory of the missing person but not knowing what has happened. And unfortunately, uh, both Thailand and Laos have continually used enforced disappearances uh, as a part of their rights abusing toolkit. Um, you know, we're looking at the situation in Laos. Um, you know, going back to the 1970s, 80s, we have a list of 22 cases of enforced disappearance. Uh, you know, where not only is it prominent cases such as uh, Kun Sombat Sompon. Uh, uh, or uh, Sompon from uh, Luang Nam Tha, but also issues of, of, of missing Hmong leaders and others who have disappeared over the years and whose names, to be honest, are increasingly forgotten now, but that these people mattered to a family, mattered to their loved ones, and are gone. Uh, if we look at uh, what the working group on enforced and inv involuntary disappearances has to say about Thailand. They have cases of over 80 Thais who have been forcibly disappeared since the 1980s. And these cases have not progressed, they've not been solved in any meaningful way. 
you know, I, I know that there's been a lot of discussion in the news about the case of Kun uh, Poleji uh, Rakjaran Jongjaran, who's the better known as Billy, the the Karen leader. Um, you know, who there has been a breakthrough in the case. The DNA was found, the remains were found. But this is an exception to the rule, if we're going to be honest here. Uh, the reality is that the use of enforced disappearances is still systematic and pervasive, both in Thailand and in Laos. And uh, we have not seen any significant progress uh, in either of these countries, despite the ongoing discussions at the Ministry of Justice in Thailand. Uh, the reality is that uh, there was a draft law on, to criminalize and force disappearances and torture. Uh, it was brought into a second reading uh, after approval by the cabinet uh, at the National Legislative Assembly under the military government, the NCPO, and it mysteriously disappeared and was sent back to the Ministry of Justice. A and key persons at the Ministry of Justice who were pushing it were sidelined. So, you know, there's a reality here that goes beyond what we're talking about. Um, in forced disappearances, there is a decision that was taken to ratify that enforced uh, disappearances convention. And that, that instrument of ratification is sitting in someone's desk at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, you know, it's like, it's like the ship that never reaches port. And unfortunately, it doesn't look like that's going to change anytime soon. What we're seeing really uh, since uh, 2014, uh, since the military coup that took place um, under the NCPO, is that Thailand is no longer safe for uh, dissidents, activists, and refugees from neighboring countries. Um, the most prominent case that I can think of right away, of course, is the case of Kun Ot Sayavong, the leader of the Free Lao group, group who I last saw actually standing right over on the backside of this room. We took a photo together and discussed the situation. Uh, he's been missing since the 26th of August. Um, the police, uh, there was a report filed with the Thai police on the 2nd of September by his colleagues and there's been no progress whatsoever. This was a very prominent activist amongst the Free Lao group here. Um, what is particularly chilling is that while in the past there had been actions against Hmong and, and former royalist leaders of the Lao, uh, the Lao royal family uh, up on the borders in areas like Ubon, Rajatani, and Nongkai going back a number of years, this is the first time in memory that we've had a Lao dissident disappeared in Bangkok. And that should give everyone pause. Um, if we look at other cases, uh, the case of uh, Trung Duy Nat, this was a Vietnamese activist, came to Thailand to seek refuge, uh, applied to UNHCR, uh, and was disappeared on January 26, 2019. He is subsequently turned up in Hanoi's um, custody uh, after what appears allegedly was a joint operation by uh, Vietnam and Thai officials to uh, basically take him from Thailand and send him back, essentially a rendition, back to Vietnam. Um, you know, and later, uh, you know, we saw uh, a number of three Thai people sent from Vietnam back to, to Thailand. What we're essentially looking at here is, we're, you know, Thailand has become a bit of a, a sort of refugee and dissident swap mart. It's like, uh, you know, the officials from these various different governments are boys with sports playing cards. I'll trade you this one for that one. Uh, the reality is that we've seen with, in Cambodia, we saw the case of Rot Rat Moni, uh, who was taken by the Thai government uh, while he was waiting outside the Dutch embassy, uh, sent back and now has been imprisoned uh, for being a fixer for a Russia Today uh, documentary that the uh, Cambodia government didn't like, and then Suddenly, surprisingly, the next day, a long-wanted black shirt uh, appears and turns himself in at the Thai-Cambodia border. Coincidence? I don't think so. We've had cases of uh, other CNRP activists who have been taken from uh, Thailand and back to Cambodia. We had the case going back a number of years ago of Seri Sam from the KNLF. Um, you know, 
when we look at the situation, even going back to a uh, uh, Chinese national, Gui Minhai, uh, who was also a Swedish national and who was taken uh, in Padia and now is back in mainland China. 109 Uyghurs were sent back against their will. Um, 52 Uyghurs are still languishing in, in Thai immigration detention, more than five years on. We've seen cases where uh, Gulenists from Turkey have been forced back from Thailand. And of course we have the case of these uh, prominent Thai dissidents, uh, Surachai Dan Watanan Uson or uh, Surachai Seydan and his two colleagues uh, who were initially disappeared. Two of them have subsequently turned up dead, floating in the Mekong. Surachai is also believed dead. And there are also two other Thai activists who are red shirts who fled to Laos and have disappeared. The reality is, you know, the Thai government and the Thai army says they have nothing to do with it. No one believes those denials. And, you know, this is the new reality here. We have essentially a swap mark going on with activists and refugees being traded between the various different governments, some cases enforceably disappeared, in some cases imprisoned and, and tried, uh, in some cases uh, killed. And, um, you know, we can celebrate in some cases where we are able to rally uh, activism in the cases of uh, Rahaf al Kanun, uh, the Saudi Arabian uh, woman who was uh, saved at the airport back in January, or Hakim Al Arabi, the uh, Bahrain uh, football player who was able to go back to Australia. But the common thread through this is that without significant outcry, by the international community, by the diplomats, by the UN agencies, uh, uh, coverage in the media, none of these cases go forward. And this is why it's so important that we are talking here again about Sombat Sompon seven years on. Because we need to demand answers. The, t the governments of Laos and the governments of other other governments in the region who are disappearing people would love us to go find something else to do. We're not going to go anywhere. We are uh, committed uh, to work closely with Hun Shui Meng and Hun Ankana to resolve the cases of their loved ones who are still missing. You know, we will stand with you all the way through. And we appreciate the support and continued assistance by the OHCHR and by uh, our diplomatic friends. But we have to redouble our efforts because we're facing a degree of lawlessness by these governments that is now becoming entrenched and it's becoming uh, thoroughly problematic. I mean, we spend a great deal of time working on these kind of cases uh, in part because without that activism, the government's wing and these people disappear and we can't allow that to happen. These people have rights. They have the right to refuge. They have the right to remain with their family. They have the right to not be enforceably disappeared. And today, and every day going forward, we have to stand up for that right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil. So now I open the floor for questions uh, to any of the panelists. Please, the mic is there. Please go up to the mic, say your name. Where you're from? Hi, yeah, I'm Marwan Mark and Mark of the Nikkei Asian Review. Just curious, uh, given the rather grim picture you've painted, uh, what about the Asian human rights mechanism? Uh, has this been raised uh, and applying pressure, has pressure been applied on governments because Southeast Asian politics, although increasingly is taking a dire turn towards the strongman rule, there are still pockets of uh, resistance against it and respect for uh, human rights. That's my first question. And a second question to uh, Phil and Shreman is, uh, I mean, Laos has uh, 14 uh, special economic zones, and I think uh, one of the, uh, I think uh, 
somewhat fell foul of raising issues of economics uh, and land in Laos. I was just wondering whether, as a result of that, this has cre created a kind of a, a clamp down on people raising questions on displacement associated with these special economic zones. Thank you. We could take, uh, before we respond, any other questions on this issue, please? If there are any other, if there are, or people are still thinking, I'll uh, request the panel to respond. Um, we also have snacks and coffee at the back. I know people already know that, but I didn't want to break up the uh, panel. So before leaving, please do have coffee and snacks. Uh, but let's continue with the discussion. Who would like to respond? Uh, I mean, I'll start. Um, I mean, I think the first question is about the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights, ICER, and, and whether there's any sort of regional solution for these issues, and, and the, the response is unfortunately no. Um, you know, ICER has continually proved to be not worth the sum of its parts. Uh, it continues to be held in a, a terms of reference straitjacket that makes it impossible for them to even receive cases. Uh, and you ask yourself, well, what does a human rights commission do? Why does it exist? Uh, I think if you asked anybody on the street, the first thing they would say is, well, a human rights commission receives cases and investigates. And so when you have a human rights commission that can't even do that according to its bylaws, is it really a human rights commission? You know, or is it just a sort of traveling circus you know, with an ASEAN logo and the idea of human rights sort of branded on it? I would say, unfortunately, it's more of the latter. There are some commissioners who are, who are good in trying to raise issues, but the sum is that, you know, it's a waste of time. Um, the issues about land issues in, in Laos, I mean, I think this is central. I mean, as, as a good friend of mine said, um, you know, the problem for Laos is that everything's for sale. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, I think the big issue about, um, what happened, of course, connected to the disappearance of Sombat is that there was uh, a feeling that there was an opening to discuss some of these issues uh, that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs seemed to um, indicate was possible. And then I think other parts of the Lao government perhaps were not on board with that and, and retaliated in the way they did. Um, you know, land issues are, are, are hugely sensitive and, and the displacement issues uh, go to the core of basic survivability in Laos. You know, if you're talking about subsistence farming and you don't have land and you're being dispossessed, what are you going to do? I mean, uh, you know, this is this is why there's such desperation. I think. Anybody else? Uh, I want to respond to the first questions about ASEAN mechanism. Uh, actually. Uh, um, from my experiences, I think that our uh, ASEAN actually did not want to interfere for other countries' affairs. And as the uh, ASEAN Charter is said that uh, they need the consensus in everything they are doing and uh, about the non-interference policy. I used to challenge with the representative of ASEAN from Laos and then uh, when asking him about uh, so, but, and then he replied, his reply is that he said that you should ask Thailand to find some shy first. So I think that it's, it's not a joke, no, but uh, I think we are serious and I think if uh, ASEAN not, like, uh, not uh, recognize the dignity of, of their people, but uh, instead of that, uh, most of the uh, their work, they concentrate on only some, like uh, the lives of the disabilities, the rights of the aging people, or something like that. Uh, when I'm the Human Rights Commissioner, I used to challenge with um, CNF, the uh, Asian Human Rights Institution. But uh, then they ignore about the extra border violations, and they not, they not want to, like the, it's, it's the same as uh, for uh, for ASEAN that uh, even the human rights institution in ASEAN did not want to like interfere with uh, other countries. So I think that um, this is very uh, 
are very sad to me, you know, that uh, even though the uh, human rights institution uh, cannot investigate about the transborder violation, that and maybe uh, Katia can uh, can get uh, some uh, information about the because uh, we have the. Uh, ASEAN Human Rights Institution, and we also have uh, Asia Pacific Forum. Yeah, but actually they not uh, want to interfere in other uh, countries. Uh, or most of most of uh, uh, the APF or CNF mostly they hand, they uh, concentrate about the empowering empowering the institution, the in human rights institution, but not yeah, but not for transborder. Violation. Uh, Shwimming, would you like to respond to the one on the SEZs? And, and, um, and then. I don't want to repeat what um, mm -hmm. Phil and um, Ankana already said about the HR um, as um, an institution to address uh, human rights violations seriously. It's just a club, it's just a waste of time as far as I'm concerned. I just want to address the second issue about land issues. Uh, Phil also has said land issues are becoming critical in Laos with the large uh, amounts of investments uh, on land and those uh, supposedly economic zones established inside Laos, even when Sumbat was working actively to raise awareness of the rights of the communities, he did not critically attack the land concession issues. He never tried to do that, knowing how dangerous and how uh, he's actually inviting trouble. So he kept away, but basically he worked with the communities um, raising their uh, awareness on the rights of their rights within the law on how to protect their own rights and access to communi communal land in the community, how they can use um, mapping system to map their, the, their lands, both privately owned and also the community land. That according to the law, both common law and also within the, the land rights law, that people have a right to use, have access, and nobody can arbitrarily take that away. That was what he was doing. And even that, as we have seen, is too dangerous. So since Sambat's disappearance, nobody, nobody would speak up. There is in Laos an organization that used to be formed by a coalition of NGOs called the Land Land Information. It, it, was, it was land issues and then turned into information. Yeah, land issues. It was supposed to address land issues, but the term issue was considered problematic. So they have to rename themselves as land information. Basically, mm. Wow. You know, trying to look at giving information to the people or address issues, and there is now a relook at the land rights um, uh, decree. And so they again tying themselves into knots, wasting a lot of time uh, looking into, you know, dot the I's and cross the T's, and it just sits there. Nothing gets, it's like the, the law. Um, that um, that uh, Ankana talked about. They went to, you know, went to Parliament and turned back and then get lost or whatever. So uh, I I frankly have no real trust or real confidence in any of this legal organ um, uh, aspects of you know organizations working on it because we have seen this governments are very very smart in delaying, in you know, window dressing. Yes, we are addressing this, we are addressing that, we are reforming the law, we are doing this, we are improving the capacity of our legal system. It's all legal mumbo jumbo, as far as the victims are concerned. We have not seen 
any progress. Okay. Uh, thank you. I think Katya would like to give a brief comment and then we'll take the next question. Please, Katya. Yes, just briefly, on, uh, a lot has been said on, on regional mechanism and AHR namely, and regional mechanisms are usually able to deliver on their mandates, but as a result of uh, commitments which start at the, at the national level. So failing which, of course, they, they stand up for a, uh, almost an impossible challenge. Um, on, on, on land issues, I, I would like also to expand uh, what has been said more broadly to the entire impact of uh, large-scale development projects. And, and I think it would be important to note, while we see um, a definite increasing interest in the region on the side of um, member states in advancing the business and human rights agenda, that this would, not, would be seen in... Uh, in total connection with also advancing what the guiding principle on business and human rights require, which is also protection and effective remedy. And so, and the number of the cases of enforced disappearances that we are aware about are linked to the implementation of large-scale development projects. So it's crucial to keep the element of accountability at the core of any business and human rights agenda. Hello. Uh, Good morning. Uh, my name is Gaspar Ruiz Canela from the Spanish News Agency. My question goes to all the panelists. I would like to know, in your opinion, if the international community, and in particular the European Union, is doing less in pushing or engaging with the region uh, to respect the, the uh, uh, human rights. And what would you like to see, what would you like to ask the international community and the European Union uh, uh, to do to improve the, the human rights situation and to avoid a uh, forced disappearance. Thank you. Okay, so are they, should we take another couple of questions and then the panel, please go ahead. Hi, I'm um, Dean with AFP. Um, I want to go back to what you said on this whole swap market of refugees and dissidents. Um, and the cases that you've mentioned are the ones that we actually know about. And I'm wondering, in your opinion, how many of these cases do we not know about, um, if you guys are tracking that, um, and what sort of the worst case scenario we can face um, if the governments were to continue doing this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's, let's have a response from our panel. The first one is on the expectation to, to, to the European Union and other international community, and the second one was on um, other cases we don't know. But who would like to start? I'll, I'll start again. I mean, okay. <laughs> uh, on, first on the case of the swap mark, um, you know, we don't, we don't know what we don't know. I mean, the reality is that uh, I think we're pretty good at getting information from the refugee communities, uh, whether they Lao, Khmer, Vietnamese, uh, Burmese, and others about cases that happen. Um, I think where we might encounter some difficulties um, is uh, people in more remote areas or in more, more remote cases. I'm thinking about cases at the border. Um, I'm thinking about cases, uh, for instance, involving the Montagnards or others uh, who, you know, we don't have good access or information about and, and how many there are here in Thailand. Um, Again, you know, it, it's it's very difficult to know how many cases we don't or don't have information about or not aware about. But I, I assume that there are some. Um, the reality is that it it really falls to the communities of the refugees and activists to try to reach out to uh, international groups like Human Rights Watch and others about these cases, and uh, you know. You know, when we hear about them, you know, then we uh, try to investigate as quickly as possible, figure out whether there is, in fact, a case that we should be uh, involved in, and then try to find out who we can get to help us to try to push back. Um, and, you know, there's, there's no exact sign to that. Um, in terms of the uh, question about what is the EU in the doing, um, I think that varies from country to country. It's a broad question. Uh, obviously, they're carrying the water uh, on human rights issues in Cambodia right now with the uh, everything but arms. Um, uh, 
discussions with the Cambodian government. Uh, they've also been very critical in uh, pressuring Vietnam using the European uh, Vietnam Free Trade Agreement and holding that up, particularly the European Parliament. Um, you know, we are seeing in the world of Donald Trump uh, a real retreat by the Americans uh, away from issues of human rights. Um, and, you know, we're quite concerned that when the UK leaves the European Union, we're going to see uh, a bigger focus from London about trade and human rights being sort of shuffled off to the side. So, uh, you know, we're constantly trying to figure out who we can engage with to get more traction with these governments. Uh, many times the dynamic within the European Union is that some member states will want to do trade deals and they ask the European Union uh, as a whole to raise the issue. We want engagement by both EU member states and the European Union itself uh, to press harder. And where we can assemble other states that will help out, whether it be Canada, New Zealand, Australia, the United States, what have you, uh, we will always try to build those coalitions to provide the maximum pressure to uh, try to protect these people uh, from being sent back into harm's way or being disappeared. Yeah, I, will, uh, I want to add a bit more about the role of European Union. I think uh, European Union uh, can, in the past this year, for, for my experience, I think that uh, for uh, the diplomat from European Union have a big uh, role, uh, for example, to support the families, support the families of the victims. Sometimes they stand with the victims. Uh, for example, like the event like this, uh, the present of the diplomat is very, um, have very meaningful. Yeah. And uh, during the UPR Thailand review, the first UPR in 2011, uh, Thailand received a lot of recommendations from the uh, European countries and also Japan. Japan is only one Asian country who gave the recommendation uh, to Thailand to um, ratify the convention and to investigate all the cases of enforced disappearance in Thailand. And the same as uh, UPR 2016, uh, uh, Thailand received a lot of uh, recommendations from European Union uh, for, uh, to ratify and to investigate all the cases as well. So I think this is uh, really meaningful. Uh, by the way, uh, I want to uh, say a bit about the role uh, about the case of Billy. Uh, I think the role of UNESCO is very important <clears throat> because uh, uh, when Thailand want to uh, 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 send uh, communication to uh, UNESCO uh, for Gangrajan uh, to be uh, World Heritage, and I, I say no, that uh, Europe, uh, UNESCO is uh, very concerned about the people who live in the forest, and very concerned about the forest eviction, and concerned about the disappearance of Billy. So this is uh, one thing that can pressure the Thai government to, invest, to have a serious investigation of Billy. Um, but it's still a long way, you know. It's still a long way. It's for Billy case, it's just beginning. And uh, the days I found a lot of fragmented of bone, but they found only one fragmented bone that have the DNA testing found that is linked to uh, Billy mothers by an other bone, they didn't find anything. And from my experience, uh, around 10 years in the court, and finally I'm lost. So uh, for Billy case, I think that we have to wait and we have to support the families. Shreemin, Katya, you would like to say Katya uh, just to complement what has been said on the, on the EU, I also believe that uh, the EU's uh, strong policy on and program of work and support of human rights defenders in the region has a critical role to play as a means to keep that space open for advocacy um, continue to be in place, including, of course, in the context of um, enforced disappearances. Um, on... Um, just to echo what Phil was saying on, you know, are, are, are there cases out there that we are not aware about? Um, most likely. I mean, if we look at uh, uh, also even the, um, the geography, but also the 
specifics of the of the various countries in the region, whether it's remote or rural areas where access even to internet is not a given, or awareness on who to approach and how to approach to make sure that someone would pick the case and bring the advocacy forward, uh, it's a bigger challenge that we can uh, estimate from where we sit. Um, and I think this is a challenge that all of us who do human rights work we are constantly faced with in making sure that there are bridging elements that can reduce that space, but um, that's the reality so far and the challenge for us all. Okay, um, just a short comment on the EU and um, the various countries that um, part of the EU uh, and also outside the EU can do. I think if the countries, a lot more, I think they can do a lot more uh, in holding the countries accountable for their human rights violations. I understand that many of the countries, um, they are, when, you know, the embassies inside the country, they are in a, a little bit of a difficult situation. They want to retain and maintain good relations with the host government and at the same time stay true to their human rights values. But sometimes they forget. It's easier to be nice. It's easy to be a nice diplomat than to hit hard. And I think we need the embassies in the respective countries. I don't expect them to become persona non grata, but I expect them to take stronger positions. Every country, especially the European countries, but including Australia, Canada, New Zealand, they have human rights dialogue. They can use that, that platform to push really hard for addressing human rights violations. Um, you know, in the case of Laos, Philip Elston came and did a report on Laos. That was the most hard-hitting report. Go back if you have a chance. And the reporters who have not seen it, go back and read Philip Austin's report on Laos. And he, it shocked the government that someone would speak so directly. I don't think Philip Austin will ever be invited into Laos anymore. <laughs> but nonetheless, he said it. And after what he said, actually, some of the diplomats are saying, yes, we should really take Philip's report seriously and address many of the issues Philip has raised. But I haven't seen real progress on that end. To quickly conclude, Laos will go for its third UPR in January, January 23rd to be exact. And a lot of preparations have been done with support from uh, the human rights organizations. Reports have been submitted to, um, to the various um, uh, missions in Geneva. We, in the last UPR, in the second UPR, Somba's case was mentioned by name. His name was mentioned by 10 countries by name. I wonder how many of these countries will continue to mention him. I think Somba's case for Laos is very unique. He was the, his was the only case where the evidence is clear what happened to him. And his case was the only one actually acknowledged by the government that yes, he went missing. So we have to step up, step up on pushing the case within the EU and within the respective countries, make use of the UPR in January on Laos again to push for somebody's case, but also all the other human rights violations, which has continued and if not become even worse today than before. The Lao government had made, accepted a lot of the recommendations. They have to be held accountable which of those recommendations are actually addressed, taken forward, but I suspect it will, again, they will present a very kind of nice report. We have done ABC, it's all words, but really no action behind it. You have, we, we the victims have no other choice 
but to depend on such mechanisms, depend on uh, the EU, the UN, and so on, to, to help us. We don't have your access. We don't have your ability to hold the government accountable. Just to finish, at the pre-session of the UPR, some NGOs were there presenting the Lao case. UN Info actually wanted to stop one of the presenters to mention Sombats by name and other victims because they say, well, you know, we are not here to mention individuals. Human rights violations are violations against individuals. They violate the right, the dignity, and the person individually. So their individual cases have to be mentioned again, again, and again. Not just like, okay, you know, you know this, this kind of uh, uh, violation still take place. They have to be named. They're not just nameless victims. They have a name. They have a family. They have a life. So I just want to appeal to the EU and whatever, the journalists and so on, help us. Please help us. Thank you. Okay. Are there other questions from the floor? While you're thinking of those questions, just... Um, no? Oh, there is one question coming up? No, I guess not. Yeah, just a couple of points that I'd just like to uh, highlight again, uh, I mean, elaborate it just a tiny bit. One is on the issue of what's happening to victims' families, as uh, Kunankana talked about Billy's family. There are a number of other families like this who are really caught in a very difficult uh, situation because they are not economically well off. Um, they are in rural areas, finding lawyers, finding, as Katya said, there's not even internet, figuring out who to go to, who do you apply, who do you go to for justice becomes a challenge in and of itself. It takes money, it takes resources. They have to, uh, you know, they, they have to uh, maintain the livelihoods of their families. Mm -hmm. The kids have to go to school. They need health care. And they are in very difficult situations because they cannot mm -hmm. even find the access then to find lawyers. Mm -hmm. So many human rights organizations, civil society groups, organize to raise the funds for legal support and so on. But it's not enough because uh, there are so many families who need that support. And this is then goes to the other point that... Um, Swimming was raising uh, was the issue of naming people. I mean, we repeatedly asked for evidence as civil society organizations, and I think Phil also referred to this, that people want evidence. I mean, the UN needs evidence. Um, and a lot of those who have evidence are scared to speak and have their names identified because of reprisals. And many civil society organizations are also facing great threats because they are working on these cases. And this then has a chilling effect. Then those who are working on these cases because they're scared of reprisals will not work on enforced disappearance cases. And the families of enforced disappearance victims and the victims become isolated. So there is a vicious, vicious cycle here which needs to be broken. I just wanted to add that from uh, you know, the perspective of civil society organizations who are many of them are here uh, working on these issues. But if there are no other uh, quest I mean, uh, questions, may I ask the, uh, well, if there are questions, please ask. But if there aren't, anyway, may I ask the panel for any final remarks, if you'd like to? But I don't know if there are questions. I, I guess not, so. Oh, please, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, my name is Susanna. I've been in Bangkok now for 12 months, but before this I was in Laos for nearly four years. So this speaks, uh, it's very nice to uh, see Shui Meng here, and also thank you for both of you for speaking so openly during uh, what is obviously a very difficult time at this time of year. You mentioned the, the report this year by Philip Alston, and the, the review. I remember watching the, the, the press conference for this. He highlighted a lot of points that the NGO community and a lot of the people working uh, on this subject have brought up for, for many years. 
I think you've already asked the question that I answered the question that I wanted to ask is where is the pressure? I mean, you mentioned the EU. They're usually very vocal about these, uh, these topics and particularly following the case of Sombat. But also, where is the UN in this? I would like maybe to ask uh, the colleague from the UN, UN here. Uh, OCHR has an office here in, uh, in Bangkok, but it's not uh, in, uh, in Vientiane. So it would be interesting to find out the, the ways in which the UN agencies are trying to work together to yeah, also add to the pressure that uh, the embassies and uh, other DPs are putting on. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? We can take one more last question or a couple of questions and then we can ask the panel to make one their, their final response. Don't be shy. Uh, hello, I'm Kevin McLeod. Um, just had a quick question about the UN Working Group on uh, Enforced Disappearances. Could, um, uh, could we hear a little bit more about that? Okay. Any, any other? Question? No? Okay. Uh, then I request the panel to respond and shall we start with Shwiming first? Or do you want to start? Me first? Okay. You want? I okay. should be answering the UN. Okay. Let's, yeah. Phil first. Why don't you answer, yeah. don't you answer the working group? first. Let Katya answer the working group question. Yes. <laughs> so just to specify that UN working group um, is an independent mechanism. So while they receive support in Geneva through ACHR, but their work is uh, is uh, delivered independently as one of the mechanisms established by the UN Human Rights Council. So what we do as an office uh, um, in the region is certainly to help strengthening the engagement with the working group whenever we come across um, cases where we identified that would be benefit from us sort of uh, bringing, uh, uh, whether it's civil society or families victims, uh, uh, specifically in touch with the, with the working group. So it's more of a facilitation uh, uh, role. And I don't know if you had any more specific question when it comes to, to the working group. Um, uh, the question that has, is related to the work of uh, our office in, um, in Laos, we, it's true we are not in the country, we are a regional office, but um, in any country where there is a UN country team, OECHR is a so-called non-resident agency. So we, uh, we are involved uh, in a number of discussions and initiatives, including, for instance, the identification of the key priorities of the UN country team in, in relation to various areas of work, of course, looking from our perspective uh, at the human rights angle of it. And other than that, of course, we are in touch with the civil society in the country and outside the country and um, supporting advocacy efforts and, and any other uh, areas of work where our work can bring value and, and support. Yeah. Uh, may I explain more about the role of the uh, UN working groups? Um, uh, for any countries that not ratify the UN Convention on Infant Disappearance, on the complaint of uh, infant disappearance will go through the UN Working Groups. The UN Working Group, they are, uh, the committee are like the expert and work independently. And for the, for the work of the Working Group is to communicate with the government in many countries. Uh, another role is that the, the UN Working Group can ask for official visit to any countries. For Thailand, I think that, uh, as if I'm not wrong, I think that uh, the Working Group used to ask to visit Thailand more than three times, but uh, not welcome from the Thai government. Uh, and if they are um, uh, invited uh, to visit uh, the country, they can they can have independently uh, uh, meeting with the victims, the family, civil society, and they can work on the report and um, have the recommendation to the government. So uh, I think that uh, their role is very important. <clears throat> for myself, uh, for my experience, uh, about the communication, it's like that when the, 
uh, we call the source. The working group will uh, receive the complaint from the source, um, the, all the families, and then communicate to the to the government. And when we get the working group the information to update situation, the working group will communicate with the Thai government. And when the Thai government reply, and the working group will. Uh, <laughs> will communicate with the source and the victims again. So I used to have question to the to the Thai government that we are together, we are very near. Why we cannot talk to each other? Because of every time we talk when asking about rights and justice, about rape and whereabouts of the victims, we often denied it. So we have to uh, ask the working group to ask the question on behalf of the victims to the government. And government not want to reply to the families directly, so they reply to the working group, and then the working group send the uh, reply to the victims. Yeah, so it's, it's the mechanism. But if uh, the country, for example, if Thailand ratified the convention, uh, all the cases of uh, informed parents uh, of the working group will refer to the uh, committee against informed parents. Yeah. Shwini, would you like to go next? Anything to say? I think we can ask. Okay. Uh, Phil, would you like to say anything as a close uh, comment? I mean, I, the last thing I would say is that uh, ultimately these coalitions of uh, like-minded countries, of UN agencies, of activists are going to have to continue to be formed and be active if we're going to actually get the sufficient pressure to get the governments to change their policies about enforced disappearances and to provide answers uh, to uh, Shui Meng, to, to Kun Ankana, and others from families who people have been enforcibly disappeared. Uh, this, is, this is an ongoing work and I think that ultimately we rely on the goodwill of many people and many agencies and many organizations to help us with that and I would appeal to you all to continue to assist, to keep your eyes open, to work with us and ultimately to try to end these practices once and for all. Okay. Thank you, Phil. Um, if anybody is interested to see the evidence of Sombat's disappearance, for example, if you go to this website, www.sombat.org, the CCTV captures which Wemming's family got from the Ministry of Public Security, they are posted there. Uh, similarly, if you go to Justice for Peace Foundation, if you go to OHCHR, New Human Rights Watch, the FIDH websites, if you go, I mean, a number of these websites, other evidence of enforced disappearance is there. But specifically for the CCTV captures, you can get them from the Sombat.org website. Also, we had copies of a statement that was released by civil society organizations. Um, I hope you all got a copy of it. If you didn't, you can always get it from the website again. Uh, this is the, you know, civil society and human rights organizations continue to work every year to bring these issues to light, working with the UN, working with the families of the disappeared, um, and working with all other victims of human rights abuses. So please get those copies and be in touch with all of us. And um, Thank you, thank you very much for all of you know for for joining us, and we hope right. that you will continue to shed, so, uh, you know, pay attention to and shed light on this continuing so on this crime. Oh, sorry. So no, just to sorry, just to add, anyone interested? There is a documentary on Sombat's enforced disappearance. Right. It's called the Enforced Disappearance of Sombat Sumpon. Uh, it's a documentary that talks about his life, his work, and his enforced disappearance. So if you all have not, anyone here, uh, have not seen who this man is, what did he do, what did he, he um, what happened to him, uh, please, it's on YouTube. It's loaded on YouTube, it's in English, it's in French, it's in German, and Indonesian, Bahasa. Yeah. So watch it if you can, thank you. Yeah, thank you. You'll find that on the YouTube channel of FI, but I think if you just Google the enforced yeah. disappearance of Sambat Sampan, you will find that film. I was going to mention that. Yes. Well, thank you again, everybody, very much. And there, is coffee, there are coffee and snacks at the back, which may have gotten a bit cold, at least the snacks, but please help yourself. Um, and thank you again. Bye-bye.